Okay. So in this chapter, we basically want to now properly define geodesics after we've discussed them informally. And we'll do this uh, actually in two ways, which then turn out to be equivalent. We are using sprays and uh, covariant derivatives um, on a manifold. And uh, let's, let's do um, one assumption for uh, one working assumption for the whole section. So um, I want to assume, uh, so for everything, in this section, assume that uh, MG is a strong Riemannian manifold. So um, in principle, in the definitions and so forth we are going to take, you can define all of this also for weak Riemannian manifolds. Um, so all is possible for um, weak Riemannian manifolds in principle, but um, uh, the automatic existence results we will be citing fail then in general. So there are explicit examples of uh, uh, weak Riemannian uh, manifolds where the, uh, the uh, elements uh, which we want to be associating to a, um, uh, to a Riemannian metric, they simply don't exist. And uh, so in, in addition, we will often be um, uh, forced to solve certain differential equation. We need to uh, compute the flows of certain vector fields. And uh, so computing flows of vector fields means we need to solve an ordinary differential equation on the manifold. And if we have a strong Riemannian uh, manifold, then we know that we are in a Hilbert space setting. So we know that there's the usual ODE solution theory, where we know at least that if the right-hand side is smooth, we get uh, local existence and uniqueness of the solution. Whereas in the weak Riemannian setting, we don't know that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start. Um, so the um, goal of the section, define geodesics. Um, um, we want to define sprays and we want to define covariant derivatives. And if you have seen them in finite dimensions, there's probably nothing new except for the sprays. I'm not entirely sure whether one does that in finite dimensions, depends probably on the course you're taking. But let me, let me first define what a spray is. And uh, so first of all, we, I mean, um, the unfortunate thing about this chapter is I need to bombard you a little bit with, uh, with some definitions. And um, then we will connect them later to Riemannian geometry and I will explain what the, what the connection to these things is. Uh, however, we will not see terribly many um, examples. Um, this is to a certain degree by design. Mm. Because, um, I mean, if you want to do really interesting examples, it gets involved. And in finite dimensions, this usually means working local coordinates, which uh, we certainly don't want to do. And um, so, um, yes, uh, but unfortunately, we need all of these techniques because we will later on, um, I mean, the next chapter, we will want to be studying the, the L2 metric. So we have already defined the weak Riemannian metric, the L2 metric. But uh, the nice thing about the L2 metric is that all of these concepts we are going to be de uh, to define uh, can be explicitly uh, constructed for the L2 metric. And this is quite useful for application and shape analysis. And I think I will get to this point tomorrow um, where we will talk a little bit about this and um, see where, what these uh, concrete constructions really bring uh, to the table. Okay, so let's, let's start uh, with the work and let's first construct a so-called spray. And uh, so 431 definition. 
um, of a spray. Um, a vector field S on the tangent bundle. So recall the uh, recall the um, definition. So this is this S is now a mapping from the tangent bundle to the double tangent bundle or the tangent bundle of the tangent bundle. And in other words, this is T squared M. So this is a vector field, meaning that um, if I compose with uh, the projection of TM, I get the identity on TM. So this is the vector space. Uh, this is the, def uh, the definition of a vector field on the tangent bundle. Is, uh, so such a vector field is said to be of second order. If the following relation is true. T pi m of s of v is v for all v in tm. Okay, and before we, um, before we go further, let us do the trivial example. So m is now a Hilbert space h. Actually, we don't need the Hilbert space structure here. You could also define this for any uh, for any locally convex space. But since we said we want strong Riemannian uh, manifolds, let's take a Hilbert space. Mm. Okay, then uh, Tm is h times h. First component is always base point. Second component is um, uh, is the vector component, uh, and we have T squared m or T squared h. This is an h times h. So this is the base point if you want. Um, so this is Tm times h times h. So we have h to the fourth. Okay. And now let's let's have a look at the s. So s is then a mapping from h times h, taking values in h times h times h times h. Okay. So and what we know is, so this is a vector field. So it sends x, which is the base point, v is the vector component. This gets sent to something which, uh, since it's a vector field, it may not change the base point, right? However, it may change something in the last components. So um, let's say this is S. Uh, one of xv and s2 of xv. Who knows whatever whatever is going on there. Uh, we now have one more relation which clarifies what's going on. This relation. Okay. So what does this red relation bring to the table? So let's let's have a look at what the pi m is here. So we are going from Tm to m, this is h times h. And here we have h. And this is just the projection onto the first factor, right? So this is the base point projection. Okay, and what the t pi m is then doing, it's going from t square m, or in other words, h times h times h times h, to h times h. Uh, or TM, if you want. Okay, and now we have to, uh, so what is the signature of this mapping? Uh, or this was the signature of the mapping. And uh, so what's happening here? So it takes X, Y, V, and W. And where does this get sent? Okay, in the first component, so remember the T pi M is given as the mapping pi m in the first component, and then we have the mapping d pi m, blah, 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 uh, of, uh, of some components which I didn't write out. So since in the first component, so the first component is here the h, this takes x, y and sends it to 
x. Okay, fair enough. And now I need to understand what is happening in, uh, in the other components and what happens if I derivate this. So I derivate uh, pi m now um, at the point x, y into the direction v, w. Okay, so by definition, this is the okay limit. So let's do Bastiani calculus, t inverse uh, pi m of x, y plus t, v, w minus pi x, y. Okay, now we can compute this. This is just x and this is x plus uh, t, v. This looks so strange. I mean, usually on a manifold, you couldn't compute this, but we are in a vector space setting. So we are actually allowed to do this. And this is then V. Okay. So this gets sent to X V. This is the formula for the tangent of the, uh, of the, uh, of the projection. And we see, okay, what does the tangent of the projection do? It sends a point x, y, v, w to x and v. So it projects onto the first and onto the third component and throws away the second and the fourth. So it's not seeing all of these things. What does that mean for our uh, second order vector field? We know because it's a vector field, it's uh, projecting onto the base point in the first component, right? And now we see if we are, uh, if we want that um, we have this red relation. So if I apply S to a vector V, I get all of this stuff here, right? Uh, so all of this, where I don't know what the S1 and the S2 is. However, our relation says uh, the result of uh, T pi M composed with S of a vector X, Y, let's, uh, sorry, X, V, I call this. X, uh, V. This is by definition, uh, so we need to single out the first component here, X, and we need to single out the third component, S1, X, V. Okay. And now the second order conditions tells us we need to end up with the same thing here with X V. So in other words, we know already what the S1 is. This needs to be here, this guy, this needs to be equal to V. So a second order vector field has a second order. If we can write it as S of X V is equal to X V V. And then we still have the S two, which we don't know. So it's just a smooth mapping, but we know that in the, we know the first three components out of four. And um, so we have done here now the trivial case where we have a vector space. However, uh, this is this idea one should have when talking about second order vector fields. I mean, locally, uh, T squared M is always uh, of the form, uh, let's say U times E times E times E, right? So where U is an open set, uh, so this is locally, um, and E is the modeling space. So, and locally a spray is completely determined in the first three components, uh, sorry, a second order vector field is completely determined in the first three components. Um, possibly, uh, and there's something, the only interesting thing which might happen is uh, happening in the fourth component. And um, while this isomorphism here is only local of the second tangent bundle, the second tangent bundle uh, might seem like a very complicated object. But whenever we are talking in this section about the second tangent bundle, I want you to think of um, something which is a product of four things. 
And the nonlinearity of this product or the manifold part is always the first one. And afterwards, there are coming three vector components. And for a second order vector field, the first three vector components are uh, uniquely determined by uh, these conditions we are asking here. However, we didn't want to define a second order vector field. We wanted to define a spray. So, and uh, for to do that, for each uh, real number, uh, we denote by um, T, Tm, a mapping from Tm to Tm. And uh, so what are we doing? So if I have a vector sitting at a point M, I'm sending it to T times Vm, right? So I'm multiplying in every fiber with the number T. Um, so this is a vector bundle isomorphism. Sorry, a vector bundle morphism, uh, which is even an isomorphism if t is not equal to zero. Mm. And uh, we say um, that a second order vector field is a spray, and this is what we were after. Um, if the following is true, so if I apply S to T times, let's say Vm, then this should be the same as T tangent mapping of this bundle morphism applied to T times S of Vm. So this should hold for all T in the reals and all Vm in Tm, M, uh, okay, and then also, of course, M in M. Okay, so this is uh, equation four, three. Right, and uh, so let's, let's look again at this guy um, in uh, the, so let, let's unravel this again in the, uh, in the setting where we have here, say, a Hilbert space. So, um, Four, three, two, in the Hilbert space case. So since S is a um, second order vector field, uh, we know already that um, S let me again write it like, so we have base point and we have a vector component. So this is then M V V uh, S2 of M and V. Okay, and now let's study this equation for three in this trivialized setting. What does it mean? Okay, what's easy, the left-hand side. So what do we mean here? So we have S, T, uh, Vm, or in other words, so the Vm is just a shorthand. So this means S base point, and the multiplication here is, is like this. So if this guy is Vm, then we have this. Okay, so we get on the right-hand side, M, Tv, Tv, and uh, then S2, M, Tv. Okay, we still don't know what uh, what the uh, what the s uh, two is, but uh, okay, we have just evaluated the right hand side of this equation. Uh, sorry, the left hand side of this equation four three. We still have the right hand side, right? So this um, this should give us now some information. Okay, and uh, what we see, uh, what we get when we do this. So first of all, we have the interior stuff here. So T times S of Vm. S of Vm we understand. So we have T time, uh, so this should be the same as T, Tm, sorry, like this, applied to T times S of uh, MTV, oh, MTV. 
you know you're old if you know what this uh, shorthand means. Um, okay, right. So we let's write out what, first what is inside of this bracket here. So we have we know what SMTV is. Uh, sorry, no, I took a T too much. Right. So there is no T here. So this is just V M here. So this T needs to go. We know what this S of the stuff is. It's M V V S two M V. And now we multiply it with T. And here, this multiplication dot is multiplication in the second tangent bundle. So this means the T gets multiplied with every vector component we have in the second uh, tangent bundle. The M is the nonlinear part, if you want. And this V, this V, and the T, uh, and the S2, those are all vector components which get multiplied. So we, uh, the formula is M T V T V T S uh, to M T uh, M V. Okay, and now we need to take uh, to compute the tangent mapping of um, of this uh, of the multiplication and apply it. So, and actually, when you do this, and this is exercise. Calculate T T M uh, of let's say X V Y uh, sorry not uh, X Y V W. So it turns out what happens if you have this. I mean, obviously nothing can uh, can happen in the nonlinear part. However, it turns out that um, the only thing which happens, you get another multiplication with T in the fourth component. And this means S2 of M T V needs to be the same as T squared S2 of M V for all M in M and V in T M M. Right. So if we have scalar multiples in the vector component with respect to this interesting part of the spray, then we can move out the, the scalar multiple, but we can only move it. I mean, we, we get a square when we are taking it out. So um, this means that the S2 is quadratic. Um, with respect to scalar multiplication in the fiber. Okay, and um, so this is another exercise. If a smooth map is quadratic in a vector component. It satisfies the following relation. And this is now interesting. S2 turns uh, of X and V turns out to be one half the derivative with respect to the second component, second derivative of this, of the map S2 at a point. So we are starting at X and then we take zero in the, in the vector space. And we take here V, uh, sorry, not uh, there, so there was one semicolon too much. So this is actually given by the second derivative um, at uh, the zero element in the tangent space of the piece, which is interesting. Um, so what we can do, mm, so if uh, M is uh, a manifold, Um, with a spray S, 
we can define a map B which takes points in the manifold and sends it to smooth functions from the Whitney sum uh, of the tangent manifold with itself into the tangent manifold, uh, which is defined locally on a chart domain. Phi, uh, as the symmetric bilinear map BU, this eats a base point X and spits out a bilinear map, and the bilinear map is given as follows. So we take the, the second derivative into the second direction of SU2 at x naught vw where um, s u2 is defined as uh, well we have a spray s we are now working on um, this uh, on this uh, on this chart domain so we can compose it with t phi inverse so remember the S was something which goes from TM ta uh, taking values in the double tangent bundle. So since it's a vector field, it makes sense to bracket it with T uh, with these two charts. So I can take the tangent of a chart. This gives me a chart of the tangent manifold. This is what is happening here. And then if I take the double tangent map of a chart, I get a, uh, I get a chart for the double tangent manifold. So this is now a mapping which is uh, defined on um, T phi of T u and this is u times uh, let's say the Hilbert space. So we are now actually in the situation, I mean this is, the, if you want from the perspective of vector fields, what I, we have on the right hand side, this is exactly the local situation we have for the chart here. So we are locally in this situation we have marked here by composing it with suitable charts. And the SU2 should now be the uh, interesting part, so the fourth component of this local formula. So what we have to do, we have to project all of this stuff away which we don't need so we project it onto the fourth component. And this is the formula for the SU2. This gives us a local representative. This is now a mapping which eats two components. So it's uh, so this is defined on U times H. It goes back into H. So, uh, I mean, actually it's not necessary to have a Hilbert space here. You can do the same definition for every locally convex space. But since I said everything is a Hilbert space, then let's stick to this. Mm. And um, so we we get, this uh, mapping B and um, we call B the associated bilinear form um, to our spray S. I mean, by this is a bit of a stretch for um, uh, um, to call B in a uh, bilinear form because it is actually, uh, so what it does, it picks base points and spits out bilinear forms, right? So on uh, the tangent spaces here, we get uh, we get bilinear forms. Um, okay, anyway, so we have, we have the B here and the B will be of interest later on. And it's important to note that on chart domains, we have this formula which determines the BU, right? And this is the local formula where we can actually do something. Now, if you have seen finite dimensional Riemannian geometry, um, then, so in finite dimensional Riemannian geometry, 
up to a change of charts, what this minus B is, this is known as, um, as the Christoffel symbol. of um, the spray S. I'm cheating here a little bit because usually you are expressing Christoffel symbols in coordinates and you're splitting up, if you have finitely many coordinate directions, you're splitting up the minus B into, uh, into the components of the vector or the components of the, of the bilinear tensor you're getting there. Um, and those are canonically called the Christoffel symbols, but I don't want to go there. So I, we really don't want to compute with Christoffel symbols. We are always computing with this mapping B. But um, so if you're interested in, um, uh, in, uh, in the exact relation, so this is recorded in Lang's uh, book from 99 Fundamentals. of differential geometry on page uh, 213 to 214. So this is the correct infinite dimensional generalization of the Christoffel symbols, if you want. And if you know finite dimensional Riemannian geometry, then you know that these Christoffel symbols play a huge role when defining what you mean uh, by a geodesic. Okay. Um, so if you haven't seen this stuff, then, uh, then this explanation won't help you, I'm afraid. Um, well, all we get here is are these sprays. Uh, so let's, let's recap a bit. A spray is a certain second order vector field with nice properties. And um, so um, this plays nice and it has an associated bilinear form, which somehow is something uh, finite dimensional geometers, uh, geometers get excited about. Hmm. So let's, um, let's go for the uh, another discussion here. So integral, uh, sorry, integral curves of uh, second order vector fields. So if uh, S is a smooth second order vector field, um, on M, say, uh, uh, we assume that uh, S admits uh, integral curves. Um, so this means those are C1 curves, uh, let's say beta from some interval j with values in the tangent bundle. Why with values in the tangent bundle? Because the second order vector field is a vector field on the tangent bundle, uh, such that uh, the differential equation S of beta equals beta dot is satisfied. So actually in our, in our strong Riemannian manifolds, we don't need to assume that this guy admits integral curves because the usual for uh, manifolds model in Hilbert spaces, we have the usual solution theory for ordinary differential equations. This is an ordinary differential equation with, uh, well, uh, unfortunately I put the, uh, what is usually the right-hand side now on the left-hand, but the left-hand side here is smooth. So by, if you're, as long as you're on a Barnack manifold, the usual ODE solution, solution theory gives you solutions to these uh, ODE. So every uh, second order vector field on a Barnack manifold admits, um, admits uh, integral curves. Um, and um, so, uh, we don't have problems for the strong Riemann metrics. The sentence with uh, we assume that it admits uh, is hinting at if you have a weak Riemannian metric, this might be a problem, right? So if you have a weak Riemannian metric, which is not necessarily modeled on a Banach space, uh, or sorry, we are not there yet with the with the Riemannian metrics. If you have a spray which lives on a space which is uh, which is worse than a Banach space, then we don't know whether there are. Uh, such integral curves because we then don't have ODE solution theory. However, what we observe here is um, what happens if, 
so I'm projecting down uh, these curves and then I derivate this at some point t. What do we get? Chain rule t pi m uh, so applied to beta prime at t or uh, actually more beta dot but okay. Uh, so this is t pi m of s of beta of t. Well and we know what happens if we apply t pi to uh, s. So we actually end up with a beta of t at the end here. Hmm. So what this means is, um, well, let's do a small picture. So we have m here. We have the tangent bundle tm sitting above, above here. And we have a curve beta of t running around here. Then we press it down by pi m using this. So we get some sort of curve downstairs here, whatever it does. So this is the curve pi m composed with beta of t. And the, form, uh, the formula says, if we take the derivative of this curve, we end up with the, uh, with the original curve. This will be important in a short while. Um, okay. Now, however, now the last thing I want to be doing with these sprays is now the following definition. And this is really the justification of why uh, am I bothering you with all of this stuff on sprays and the integral curves, right? So you might have wanted, I, we started and said we want geodesics and now the geodesics come. So uh, C2 curve alpha, again on an interval with values in M is a geodesic. Uh, of the spray S if the curve alpha dot, so this is now some a curve from J with values in TM, is an integral curve. Of S equivalently If alpha satisfies the geodesic equation, uh, d dt square second derivative of alpha t is equal to s of alpha dot t. So this should hold for all t in this interval j. Uh, so, or equivalently, this becomes in local coordinates, say on a chart domain U5, the relation here is with, I'm suppressing all of the identifications and marking the charts. So this is D square dt square alpha of t. This is b alpha t, uh, sorry, at u of these guys, alpha dot of t, alpha dot of t. All right. And if you have seen finite dimensional uh, Riemannian geometry, we said that those guys here are something like the Christoffel symbols. You should recognize that the equation we get here and this or what I call the geodesic equation for the spray, if these bu alpha uh, bu alpha t thingies are really the um, uh, the Christoffel symbols of some metric, this will give you on the nose the geodesic equation for your Riemannian metric. At the moment, we uh, we just have this concept of a spray. It's not clear at the moment how sprays are related to Riemannian metrics. Um, it's just that we, we get certain vector fields and these vector fields are um, built in a way which allow us to define a certain second order ordinary differential equation called the geodesic equation. And this second order ordinary differential equation is uh, a very useful tool to study geodesics. Because then at least if you're in a setting where you have uh, 
local existence and uniqueness of um, uh, solutions to ODEs. We have this ODE uh, here and um, we know for abstract reasons then that at least geodesics will exist. I mean, whatever the meaning is of these geodesics, this is not clear. We will see uh, in the next um, part uh, how these geodesics are connected to um, uh, some uh, something else which is called a covariant derivative and with the covariant derivative we then will be finally able to connect the sprays and their geodesics to uh, Riemannian metrics and uh, then we uh, it will be clear what the relation is between these geodesics we have just defined to the geodesics I was informally talking about. Okay, but then uh, this is a topic for the next lecture. <laughs>